Super happy to be here to join you all in person um, at SciPy this year. Uh, just to get this out of the way, I, I only have attended SciPy virtually. Um, I, haven't, I didn't attend in the before times, um, so my first time was 2020 and then 2021. So now I'm glad to be here. Um, so as Kevin said, I'm the chief ML engineer at Union AI. It is a startup that aims to make production grade machine learning infrastructure and tools easier to use by a wider group of people. Um, so on that front, I'm going to talk to you today about Flight, which is an open source project that's housed under the Linux Foundation. And Union AI is one of the chief, the, the main sort of maintainers of it. We build new features. We help, you know, um, guide the project into the future. And in particular, I'm going to talk to you about production workloads in machine learning, and in particular, uh, four dimensions of what production even means. Um, in this case, I couldn't get the alliteration right, so I failed at that. But I'm going to talk about reliability, reproducibility, recoverability, uh, and auditability in machine learning. So before getting into that, um, just wanted to give you a little bit more context of where I'm coming from, sort of a little bit about where, where you know, what my journey is. Um, I got a bachelor's in biology and dance, um, went into public health, and that's when I started doing statistics and coding, and I fell in love with coding, and so uh, now here I am. Um, I'm a flight kit maintainer, which is the Python SDK for, for flight which I'll get into in a, a little bit. I'm also the creator of Pandera, a data validation library that I've presented here in the past, um, and also of UnionML, which is also you know, an open source project, maybe um, a topic for another presentation. And you know, these days, I like to build tools for machine learning and data science folk, um, like you, maybe. And uh, you know, these days, I only have uh, free time to build, you know, whimsical models that don't make it anywhere, but just for fun. All right, so the crux of my talk is that building statistical software presents unique challenges when compared to the traditional software development life, life cycle. Um, and when I say statistical software, I mean anything that relies on data, where that data is used to produce some artifact that you then use downstream for some application. So this includes, you know, let's say traditional statistics, classical statistics, machine learning being like, I guess, statistics where you don't care about a lot of things. Um, you know, no dig to the machine learning folks. But um, the corollary to this statement is that I wanna I wanna propose that strong types, granular dependency and resource isolation caching, and data lineage tracking unlocks production level machine learning system, both in production, but especially in development context. And so I'm going to unpack a lot of these. And, and again, maybe these, these, these aren't unique to building machine learning systems, but they help tremendously when you're you know, getting your hands dirty, curating data, maybe labeling it, cleaning it up, building models, debugging those models, et cetera. So just to go back to the super basics, this is just like a schematic cartoon of what traditional programming looks like, right? So you and I, as programmers, we write the program. And during the development phase, we, have, we either craft some test input or we have some test input at hand. We put it through the program and get some output. And what's not pictured here is you, you have some assertions, unit tests, integration tests, um, functional tests, whatever you want to call it to make sure that that program is doing the right thing. Um, and this process of writing is you know, symbolic, really. So you're writing code. You're writing symbols on an IDE somewhere. Um, and that defines the behavior of your program. You then put it to production. And then you get some real inputs. And you get an output. And this output is consumed by some Know, system, some application somewhere uh, in the world. 
So statistical programming, let's just stick with machine learning since that's uh, in the title of this talk. In statistical programming, it's, it looks kind of similar, but it's quite different in practice. So, you know, as a programmer, you both write a meta program. And in this case, let's say it's a learning algorithm, some kind of routine that finds some global or lo local optimum of some space, parameter space. But you're not only doing that, you're also curating some data. And so in a supervised learning setting, you are curating some kind of input-output mapping. That needs to be high quality, you know, garbage in, garbage out, and all that. And those two pieces, so the meta program optimizes some other program, which is the thing you care about. Say it's an image recognition or a sentiment analysis model of some sort. And the training data constrains that what that meta program finds in its parameter space. And here, this program is ultimately what you care about. You know, in the in dev setting, you have some, you know, you have, this is where the test set comes in, where the analogy comes in. You have some test input, you get an output, and, you know, that's where your evaluation metric comes um, when you're using that output to assess it against some ground truth. The production picture of this, you know, I'm skipping a lot of stuff, but uh, it looks very similar to this picture. Um, but you deploy it at some, in some context, and maybe it's an endpoint that some other application hits, um, you know, to get some uh, predictions out of. So I want to say, like, even though these two pictures look quite similar, in practice, because the training data is such an integral piece of the program that is written or optimized by your meta program, this is what makes, you know, arguably what makes machine learning really hard. hard to, it's hard to debug, you know, the decision tree or the random forest or the neural net that came out of this optimization process. And so the four pieces that I'm going to focus on today, um, which are, I want to say unique, have unique flavors, um, but is by no means at a high level unique to statistical programming, are these four things. So you have reliability. When data, data passing through my pipelines violates certain assumptions that I've specified, I should know about it ASAP. And also, conversely, if my pipeline is succeeding, if my pipeline, pipeline succeeded today, I could be fairly certain it's going to succeed tomorrow. And if not, I should know sort of the, what the core reasons are. The second part is reproducibility. When I run my pipeline or parts of it, I can expect consistent behavior provided that it's that I've given in the same input. Third, on the recoverability piece, when my pipeline fails, I should be able to resume execution from the failure point after I fix the underlying issue without wasting any compute. And finally, during and after a pipeline run, I should be able to inspect all the inputs and outputs of the nodes of my execution. So now I'm going to go into how Flight addresses some of these key issues. And just to give you a little a tagline of it, it's a data and machine learning aware orchestration platform that enables highly concurrent, scalable, and reproducible workflows for data processing and machine learning. To give you a really super high overview of how Flight works, on the left-hand side, you create workflows locally in your development environment. So you import FlightKit. I'm going to go into what tasks and workflows mean in the FlightKit world. And right below it, you see a certain you know, uh, execution graph, right? Uh, a, B, C, B, E, and F. They're connected in some logical way. You take this graph. You do something that we call serialization and registering it to a flight cluster. Um, all parts of this are open source, including Kubernetes, which Flight is built on top of. But when you serialize and register your workflows, you have some kind of compiled workflow, which I won't get too much into in this, into this talk, but you can think of it as a, some kind of pro protobuf format that is strongly typed, and therefore you can statically analyze the graph to see if the pieces are compatible with each other. You also dockerize your workflows and tasks 
And it, you have to config, you, you add some configuration here that I also won't get into. But once you've done these things, you can execute it on a Kubernetes cluster. And you can see this graph replicated multiple times, three times here, right? And in the, this blue box, each of those white nodes is a Kubernetes pod. If you're not familiar with Kubernetes, you can think of it as a container. It's a, a, the basic unit of compute where you do some kind of job where you want to keep track of the input out of output inter interface. OK, so for the rest of this talk, I have 20 minutes. Um, I want to dive into this you know, nice data set uh, that I've started to use for just demoing stuff, uh, which is a data set of penguins. Each row in this data set is a tabular data set is an individual penguin. And they are one of three species, Chinstrap, Gentoo, and Adelie. And the data, the, the, each column is uh, some property of that individual. So bill length, bill depth, weight, and a bunch of other attributes. And so that it's not super abstract, here's, here's a, a general sense of what the data look like. You know, so if you plot bill length and flipper length um, colored by the species, you can see that you know, just eyeballing it, there, you know, there's some meaningful clusters there that you could potentially classify. All right. So it's demo time. I'm going to hop into my terminal and editor. And I'm going to go through 11 examples, starting with just some basic introduction into flight and how it works. So then I'll get into the, those four aspects. But first, I wanted to show you what the syntax looks like, how, how it looks and feels, and how you might develop execution graphs um, that are production grade, as I am claiming. So first, we import FlightKit. Um, and so you can think of a task. You can think of this function right here, right, get data as a containerized, a Docker containerized function that is strongly typed. And what I mean by that is if you look at the pandas.data frame return annotation, um, flight is strongly typed. And so you can just have a, a function with no inputs. So that makes sense. You can just call it by itself. Um, you could also have a function that does not return anything. So it does something. But for it to do, for it to pass data, to some other task, downstream task, you're going to have to say what its output signature is. So you can see here that we're loading the penguins data set um, using this uh, package here just to call out. Oh, I'm in the wrong example. Apologies. Oh, yeah. So it looks very much similar. So this is the, the kind of intro uh, example. We're just loading the penguins data set. We're grabbing a few columns from the, the table, and we're dropping null values because I'm just lazy right now. Um, and you can see that I'm, I'm creating the building blocks for my little machine learning pipeline here. Our, our goal here is to get some data, split it into training and test set, you know, all the standard stuff, um, training a model, evaluating it on the train and test. So these are my building blocks. I'm splitting the data, as I said. I'm training a model. I'm evaluating it. And now I compose it together into a workflow. So a workflow looks kind of like a function, but it's not exactly a function. This is your um, execution graph construction language. And it's sort of a, it's a subset of Python. Um, but at the very basics, you can call tasks inside a workflow and you build a graph just based on function calls. Um, so we're getting and splitting the data at the top here. We're training a model. And then we're evaluating the train and test accuracy of that said model. I can actually run this locally. It, it is just Python. There is some special stuff wrapped inside. But you know, if I go in here and I call Python and go. Hopefully, the demo gods smile upon me today. Um, yeah, so you know, you get 
this uh, output that has the, contains the model, um, the, train the training performance, and the test performance. Um, it is curious that the test performance is 100%, but I think it's because the data set size is really small. And this is it. This is how you express um, execution graphs in flight. And to make this a little more graphical for you, this is the flight console. So this is also the ships with flight. This is also open source. Um, I have reserialized and registered my um, example. And you can see here that I have an, a successful execution of this workflow. And like many other orchestration tools out there, you have some kind of graph representation. And this shows you, you know, basically graphically what my graph looks like. Um, and I can go in and inspect different pieces of it. I can look at the input, right? So the inputs to this were some data, split, um, a parquet file, and a Python pickle blob. That was my model. The output is the accuracy. Um, and so this, is, this part is the kind of getting at the auditability. I don't think I'll have time, actually, to go through all of these examples. But I did want to show you just graphically what it means to build more complex things out of this. So you could, do, you could build a model tuning graph out of this system, right? So here, what I'm doing, I'm just going to show you the graphical piece. That's a little bit more easy to grok um, just at first sight. So I'm reusing all the same components here because they're just functions. There's nothing special really about them. But I'm swapping out the model training piece for a tuning piece. So the input to this workflow is a hyperparameter grid. Um, I'm tuning this C parameter, which is the regularization parameter for, I believe, a logistic regression model. And you can see it fans out to train a bunch of, of those hyperparameter configurations. I have a reduction function here, get best model. All that does is it gets the models as well as the validation performances of each of them, gets the max accuracy, um, and you know the rest. You pick the best one, and then that's the thing you deploy. Another way you can express model tuning is through map tasks. So map tasks are kind of like the map function built in in Python. Uh, the way this looks is the following. You can map a particular function, in this case, the train model function, over some list or some collection of parameters. So in this case, I'm mapping over, again, the same four hyperparameter uh, configurations for a model tuning use case. Flight also ships with a bunch of plugins. So, you know, just to show you an example of one of them, um, it ships with a SQLite uh, task type. Um, so this is a kind of a this is an example of a, temp, a task template plugin. Um, this this isn't a function, but all you have to give it basically is a query template. In this case, we're just grabbing the data from a remote SQLite database. Um, but FlightKit also ships with a SQL Alchemy plugin, a Snowflake and a bunch of other uh, SQL-like tools. Now, if I go down here, you can see that I'm pre-processing data using pandas. Um, I'm just aliasing it with this Penguin's data set um, alias. I, I don't want to go into too much of that. But right below, you can see that there's a pre-processed data, uh, PySpark. And this really, I just wanted to show this before going into the other uh, dimensions of this talk which is that you can configure a task to ephemerally spin up a Spark cluster, do your Spark job inside that task, and um, go from there. Um, so the next thing I want to show you is the, the strong type system. So this is an example where the get data function task passes the data to a split data task. So if I were to change the uh, type signature here, and if I try to register and serialize this workflow, take a few seconds.
Flight is going to complain. So it's analyzed the graph, and it's saying we have mismatching types. So this is a productivity saver, basically, because your flight workflows are analyzed statically. And you, know, you can't really help what happens within a task. But at the interface of different tasks, you can basically type check your entire DAG and know, you know before blowing up at runtime, know whether your workflow is a compatible, is, has compatible components. As I said, I don't think I'll have enough time to go through all of these examples. Um, but the last example I'll show you is the auditability piece. So here I have an example of where I'm using Pandas profiling to basically create what we call a, a flight deck. So you can basically embed HTML as metadata associated with each of your tasks. So in this case, I'm showing you a Pandas profile of exactly that, the, the penguin's data. So you can look at it at the, in the console, and you can see, you can basically embed Markdown. You can embed any arbitrary HTML. We do strip it out for security reasons, um, uh, for various tags, like script tags and things like that. But um, basically, you can, you can embed a lot of different rich reporting artifacts into your workflow straight up. The last thing I want to show you is workflow execution recovery. So here I have a trained model task. I'm doing the model tuning example again. So I'm, I'm tuning a grid of um, hyperparameters. Uh, hyper and here I'm actually si simulating a system level error with this flight recoverable ex exception. So when I tune my model, I can use caching and retries of my trained model step. So let's say you know 25% of my train runs fail for whatever reason. So this might be lower in, in a real world use case. Um, I actually have an example where because you're, you're caching successful runs and you're retrying failed runs, you can actually recover from you know, certain catastrophic failures that you, didn't, you couldn't control. So this is an example where I had a successful run, but if you see here in this node, right? It failed on the first attempt, and it succeeded in the second attempt. So this is a case where in your um, graph construction pipeline language, you have an expressive way of saying, I want to cache the outputs. I want to retry. And that you know, helps you protect against a lot of like, the crazy things that might happen in the world. So for example, if your remote database just goes out for whatever reason, you know, kind of temporarily, your, your system is reliable enough to catch up and um, start where you've left off. So I'm going to go back into my presentation. And I wanted to actually pull out some, of, um, some tool agnostic strategies for production and machine learning. So we know sort of software best practices. I just wanted to list them out here, just, you know, so uh, I'm not leaving it out. Things like ver version control, testing, continuous integration. But when it comes to reliability, you kind of want a system that enforces data types between the boundaries of your execution graph. And you also want um, a way to extend the type system so you can add rich type annotations to it, things that the flight system doesn't ship with. On the reproducibility piece, um, you want to explicitly par parameterize random seeds for stochastic computations and then isolate dependencies and resource requirements at a granular level. I didn't show you this, but at the task level, you can, you, you can allocate variable resources. So if your get data step requires you know, 64 CPUs and your training step requires GPUs, flight gives you that flexibility. On the recoverability part, I showed you caching, which is you know a very uh, this is nothing new. Um, supporting node level retries and checkpointing intermediary progress within nodes. This is something I didn't show either, 
but you can basically checkpoint within a task the progress of your training run, you know, so you can save your model every, you know, at every number of epochs. And finally, on the auditability piece, it's good to invest in some kind of data lineage tracking system. Um, so you have a human readable paper trail. And finally, a system that enables rich, extensible, and immutable static reports. So we know all about this meme, right, testing in production. One thing I kind of, you know, want to popularize is the idea that you can actually productionize during development. And Flight is a toolkit that allows you to do just that. Um, for more resources, you can visit these links, um, and you can reach out to me uh, at Cosmic B-Boy on Twitter. Thanks so much. Uh, we have a lot of questions, so just want to dive right in. Number one, does flight come with a scheduler also? Yes. So you can, I didn't show it, show it, but you can add a cron schedule. There's a little syntax you add to a workflow. Add a cron schedule, and it'll run at that specified schedule. Uh, num number two, does flight handle non-machine learning workflows, such as a data modeling workflow? Uh, such as, sorry, data. Data modeling. Data modeling. Maybe ETL? OK, yeah, yeah. so it, it'll definitely handle it. You know, Machine learning sounds like a special case, but if you built a machine learning uh, orchestrator, you've necessarily built a data ETL processor uh, orchestrator as well, because you know, machine learning requires data. Um, so it definitely does support that with um, a lot of the integrations we have. Number three, does Flight work with GCP and Vertex AI? Does it offer any functionality that Vertex AI does not? So we run on AWS, GCP, and Azure. I think we do have an Oracle user as well. But on the Vertex AI, I can't really answer that question. I'm not too familiar with that product. Uh, Vertex is like AWS ECS. OK. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure how to. OK. Yeah. Uh, Xavier's asking, are there additional steps to deploy the workflow that you demoed? Yeah, so um, the two command line calls that I quickly did right here were the steps for deployment. So you basically serialize and register. We're working on an a interaction that where it's just a single command. OK. Kevin Hanselman is asking, how are data or artifacts shared between tasks? Can a task be a generic container that executes non-Python code? Yes and yes. So wait, sorry, the first question is not a yes, no answer question. Uh, so data is passed through a blob store. So if it's AWS, then you're using S3. If it's GCP, you're using GCS. Forget all the acronyms, but um, you use a blob store if you're passing files, uh, bytes over from task to task. Um, uh, if you're using a database, then you write to the database within the task, and then you, know, you query that database in the next one. Um, and sorry, what is the second part of that question? Can the task be a generic container that executes non-Python code? Yes, so um, there is a raw container task type and a bash script task type. So basically, uh, a little bit of overhead here where you have to build that Docker cont container with your arbitrary code. But once you've done that, it is now just uh, executable. There is a way for us to um, express the types, input and output types of that container as well. Um, the SDK itself is in, in Python right now, but we do have a Java Scala and a brand new JavaScript um, SDK. How does flight compare to Airflow? It seems heavily inspired by it. What does it improve? Yeah, so the, the story here is that flight v0 was an Airflow fork, um, which started, so uh, flight started at Lyft, uh, platform, ML platform engineering team at Lyft. They forked Airflow. I think the main pain points they hit against that, because at, at the time, Airflow wasn't really data aware. You couldn't really pass data easily between Ops, uh, Airflow Ops. I, I've never actually used Airflow myself, so I'm just kind of uh, 
saying what the narrative was here, uh, maybe Airflow has solved that problem. Um, so that was the initial uh, improvement that they made over Airflow at the time. Um, but at this point, Flight is it's, it's, it's kind of a opinionated beast. And like the main differentiator is that resource and dependency isolation at the node level. So you can configure, because it's built on top of Kubernetes, you can configure whatever resources you want, you know, Spark clusters at the, at the node level without worrying about breaking someone else upstream or downstream. They, you know, so if you have multiple teams, you can have one that takes care of data processing. They can use whatever, you know, pandas, v, whatever. And then you can use another version of pandas if you want, and that you can develop in that. And because they're containerized, they're just passing the data, and you don't, you're not you know, going to break each other. And so you have that separation. Uh, there are a lot more questions, but we can't get to it because we have a scheduled break now. So I invite you guys to talk to Niels or to message him. And I'm sure he'll respond to the Slack questions also. Uh, so with that, let's give Niels a warm round of applause.